Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Many times when you're working with a designer, interior designer, a builder gets involved. That's part of a lot of projects where you transform your living space, your workspace, and there's a lot going on there. We're going to look at that from both angles, from the builder angle, construction angle, and the design angle. We've talked with her a lot, learned a lot along the way. She is the woman behind a great company called GoGo Design Group. She's Rebecca Paganitz, and she's back with us. How are you doing today? I'm awesome. I'm awesome. Thank you, Steve. Hope you're well, too. Yeah, doing fantastic. Looking to learn a lot. Yeah, you know, been down this road before, as I said many times to you, Rebecca. Should have hired you because I, <laughs> I, I, I managed it myself and I'm fully transparent to admit at one point it gave me a legit ulcer in a project. I'm not, I'm not even um, making that up. I'm not. Um, you've got a guest. Tell us who this is. Well, that ties into, I'm so sorry you got a legit ulcer, but that ties into what we're going to be talking about today. Um, my special guest today is my friend Teak Barton and colleague, collaborative partner. We work Hello. together. Hey, Teak. Hi. And um, Teak and I thought it would be a good idea to educate everyone about what to expect. And really, it's your project team's job to take on that stress and worry um, and just resolve it behind the scenes. So hopefully our clients do not get ulcers. <laughs> Utique, it's great <laughs> to have you on board here. And it, it really is about, you. Uh, it's, a, it's the team. How do, you, how do you build that dream team? There's so many different components going on, you know, from the builder, the construction level, Electrical, plumbing, on and on and on and on. How do you build out that dream team? Do you want to speak? You know, it was a process of it was just a process of elimination after thirty five years of working with different people. The ones that I really dug and are excellent stuck around, and they want to work with me, and I want to work with them. So you know, there is no magic formula. It's just like, hey, I love working with you, man. Your your attitude, your product is great. Uh, you're a team player. Cool. So they stick around, and now I have the same people for decades. Wow. I, mm -hmm. And that says a lot, and that's what we're talking about here. And Rebecca calls upon you, Teague. She trusts you, and it's kind of, it's almost like pass it on. So for you, uh, Teague, you've got, you've got your Advice people. Advice first. Yeah. Yeah, and obviously I love working with Rebecca, and she has her people. We've kind of merged the people we love best. And, uh, you know, we, we couldn't build – the insanely complex sometimes projects that we work on without having this unified team that works shoulder to shoulder every day on the same projects. It just, it couldn't happen. So what are the expectations of your dream team? What, what can be expected? That things are going to go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's what they should expect. <laughs> but what they do expect is everything's going to go perfectly. Right, right, right. But yeah. we're here to slightly disabuse them of that concept that everything's going to go perfectly. <laughs> and if something does go wrong, it's, you know, the ceiling has fallen down. It's all gone. Um, it's going to happen. Even if you have the best of the best of the best of the best, stuff's going to happen. Stuff's going to pop up unexpected. You're going to find, you know, that uh, that beam wasn't the supporting beam as you thought it was when they built that house, you know, 58 years ago. And that things are going to happen. I believe with the right team, they respond to it, figure it out and move forward at, at the best possible cost and scenario. Does that sound right? Yeah. The response is really the, the measure of the market. And I talked to a client, a mutual client that Rebecca and I were working with yesterday. They said this this small glitch happened, no big deal. And he was getting all anxious about it. And I said, look, man, I got 10 problems every day. And he says, yeah, but you're used to it. If there's one problem, the client's saying, I'm anxious. I'm like, okay, see, that's the difference between you and me, client builder. Yeah, Rebecca think, probably feel the same. Yeah, I think that's also where trust comes in. So uh, when you do, when you, as a client, when you're building your team, you have to trust your team. So that's why... We always offer and refer our collaborative pro 
partners because we trust that we're going to get it done right. So there has to be a degree of trust, but trust is hard, especially if you don't know the person on a personal level or whatever. Um, but yeah, there has to be a trust that we're going to get it done and let us handle the stress. I always say that when I first talk to to clients and it's our job to remain calm at least in front of them <laughs> and um, resolve it. And there's always an answer. And just as an example, we had these very narrow slabs that arrived at our uh, fabricator for the fireplace and one of them arrived damaged. And um, that's just something we cannot control. And so now we're trying to find material to replace it. And Unfortunately, um, it happens, but we almost always stay on schedule and, you know, when things like that happen and we get it done. Yeah. And mm -hmm. we just want to set realistic expectations that there are things beyond our control and let us handle the stress. Mm -hmm. Let us handle the stress. Mm -hmm. and, and I understand that, you know, the, the client where something popped up and they're in freak mode. Because it's their baby, it's their investment, it's their house. So I, I, I get it. I see it. Been there, been there, done that. You know, I've gotten to a point in my life, and this is in the general scheme of things, nothing surprises me anymore. That's how I roll. <laughs> nothing surprises me. So when you open that wall, it's like, ah, all right. It's just the financial hit. If that comes up, you have to yeah, maybe pad a little bit for those things or, or cut back a little bit to make up for it just in case, you know, something, something comes away. We didn't, we didn't expect. Steve, I think I'm going to hire you as my project expectation consultant. <laughs> <laughs> so you can be the liaison between my clients and myself. Like uh, you got to talk to Steve, man. Steve's going to set you straight. It, it took me decades to get there. Trust me in my journey. <laughs> uh, let take, let's look at that for a second. What are some of the, things that have come up during a project that maybe wasn't unexpected just to illustrate that these things come up well like you pointed out maybe some framing is missing from a prior remodel or something or if it's new construction you know maybe this doesn't look the way we thought it would on paper so we're going to adjust it but again you know as rebecca said there's an answer for everything the way you address these things is the measure of the bar mark i want to add too that it's important that the team has a unified front to the client. You can't have one person throwing another guy under the bus, like, well, you know, trying to get cover for themselves. That that doesn't work. Team has to be unified and has to present a unified face of confidence and competence to the client. I had a client, we were building a really high-end home for a few years ago. And the client was seriously loco. I mean, at the end, this client actually admitted that they're bipolar, like that kind of loco. So at one point, the client was starting to come at me with crazy accusations and stuff. And the architect who I was working with, he tried to like conveniently distance himself a little bit from me so that he wouldn't be the recipient of this crazy fire. And I, um, I said, man, we've got to stand shoulder to shoulder. We have to have a unified front and answers for this client. Uh, and sure enough, next thing that happened is this client started flaming the architect as well. And then he saw the truth in what I was saying. So I said, there can be no daylight between us in our correspondence with this client. Mm -hmm. So we got through it. Cool. Client was happy in the end, but you can't have one person throwing another person under the bus just to try and yeah. absolve themselves of responsibility for an issue. You can't. Right. And that's why it's a really good idea to work with a team who is used to working with each other, because mm. oftentimes I'll come into a project with a contractor and we've never worked together. And I always try to line up my ducks at the beginning, but sometimes I get thrown a curveball because he or she likes to do it a certain way and didn't consult with me. And so it's just like a well-oiled machine when we're all together. And, and that outside yeah. person that you might not have worked with before, they might not have any intention of working with you ever again. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's transactional for them and it's convenient to sure. defer blame to this other person. Like, But if you work with a team like we do on every project, we're going to see the same people on the next project and the next project. So you got to 
keep it together. And it's, I believe it's about personalities. Sometimes egos come into play. And if you work with the same team, you know, however, everybody plays together. You know what to expect when it's somebody just coming in from the outside. Um, you got to vet them. You got to figure out, you know, what's, what's their mentality and all of that. You, you guys are bringing back memories because I'm in between houses. I sold a house not too long ago. And when I first moved in, I was in there about seven years. Uh, they had moved the washer and dryer upstairs to an upstairs bathroom. And it was an older couple and they had some mobility issues. So they figured, let's take it out of the basement. So I get in there. I'm like, nah, that's a kid's bathroom. We're going to move that stuff downstairs. It's going back into where it was ready to go. And then realize that they built it. The, they had done some construction. The door frame was built around the appliances that were already in the bathroom. So I had to take off the doors, the jabs, all <laughs> It's like, uh-huh. I look at like, what? what? It, and, and these are the things you don't expect. You know, I've got a couple of friends over. All right, dude, let's go. Let's move the washer and dryer. That's not happening today. But you, yeah. you, you never know. You never know what's coming your way. Um, what What is the process for the construction? Now, Rebecca, we've talked before about uh, the design process. Now we're we're going from design to construction. Can you walk us, you know, kind of basically through that whole thing? I'll let T. Well, we, uh, we destroy whatever's there. We build some new stuff. It's cool. The end. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, well, the okay. first thing is we got to get drawings. And what's nice about Teak's firm is, first of all, you have to make sure you don't need a permit and all that because you don't want the project to get shut down if you uh, get in trouble. Can I, but, can I jump in with, yeah. a, with a slight pause button there on permits because I'm hearing this from... From lots of friends, I'm in the New York area suburb of the city, and I've been down that road with the permits, particular two towns that I've lived in around here. Um, Mm -hmm. Very challenging. Is it like that around the country when it comes to getting permits? Like It takes forever. They double, triple, quadruple check everything. Is it it like that everywhere else? It it differs. It differs per village, per town, per city. It differs. You just have to, I always, Teak is the expert on that. Um, You know, in the city of Chicago, it can be very strict and I get surprised because sometimes people don't need a permit. If you're meeting, if you're moving plumbing, possibly yes, but possibly no, it's very complicated. So I always lean on my builder to answer that question. What do you say, Teak? Yeah, in the Chicago area, we work besides Chicago, a couple dozen different villages and cities that are right next to each other. And they are all different. Mm, okay. There's been a long wish by builders, uh, people in the building industry to, to unify. Like, can't you just use the same code? Can't you just use the same rules and inspectors? No. So they're all using BOCA, the standard code guide, but then they have in the margin, we want this, and here's the exceptions we want here. Some villages, you have to take a test to get a general contractor's license because they want to make sure that you know these specific things that they want in their village. So, yeah, it's, mm. it's tricky. Wow. It's a hassle. But, you know, it is it is for the benefit of the homeowner because they're there to make sure that it's not slipshod work. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't shy away from inspectors because I know all of them and they know the people that have been working with me. Like, oh, Daniel's working on this project. We love him. Oh, Marson's your plumber here. He does great work. So that's fine. Yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's also a money grab, too. That's my opinion, a lot of it. A lot of it is. Uh, <laughs> and I found that out with that backyard reno that I did that caused the ulcer. Um, uh, I got mm-hmm. a, a pergola. I added a pergola around the pool area. You know, it wasn't even big. Made 12, 12 by 12, right? Um, bought it at Costco. 1500 bucks. If I had a running start, I could take it down. You know, it was... Mm-hmm. I found out I need a permit for that. It's an open structure. And then when I called them up and I knew the... Um, One of the council people, they said, yeah, I wasn't even aware of that. And she said, you know what I found out too? Those big deck boxes, like the uh, uh, Rubbermaid, the bigger ones, right? That you didn't get to store your towels in and cushions it. You need a permit for that. So You need a permit for everything. If you move an outlet, you need a permit. If you move a pipe, you need an outlet, really. But there comes a point of practicality where right. it's not really worth pulling a permit and the city really doesn't want you wasting their resources pulling a permit for something. So gotcha. Yeah, I don't wait. Okay. So back to the, 
we we're at the <laughs> we're at the design level. Yeah. We've got our permits. What's next? The so next. we start building, start building, and it's you know, there's two ways to build. There's one way where uh, I'm stand. Here's the plan. Get out of my way. I'm going to build your thing. I don't need any involvement with you, Mr. or Mrs. Homeowner. I'm just going to build this thing. <laughs> and that's not the way we build. When we build, we're constantly collaborating and thinking, how can we make this thing better, cooler? So even though we might have designed it, there's only so much you can anticipate on paper. When you're standing in the structure, uh, feeling it, sensing it, you get ideas, and you're constantly trying to improve on it and collaborate on it. Cool. And while we're doing this, communication is really the key. Constant communication with the client. Because if you don't communicate with them, you, you're not setting the narrative of what's happening in the build. They'll start setting their own narrative. And the narrative tends negative the longer you don't communicate with your client. So to that, and I developed this thing, Rebecca is well familiar with, I call it the Friday update. Every Friday, we do this email update for our clients. That's a breakdown of everything that's happening in their job. And I'm just going to do a low tech and show you. What it looks like. <laughs> so it just runs through the cool. entire project with pictures. And oh, I can't Even hear you. All the costs. Okay. Here's your tech stuff. Here's your fireplace. So uh, and just go through every aspect of the job. Do this every Friday, and it gives our clients great comfort. They can see exactly what's happening in their home. And what's cool about it is that you can see people that need to be in on it, like from back at a designer, a kitchen person, a landscaper, a lighting contractor, all the people. And then at the end. We kind of review, here's what that looks like. We review what just happened, what decisions are going to be made now, what's coming up next. It comes every Friday. And this thing is fantastic. Clients love it. It's like watching their favorite Netflix series, except it's the construction of their home. And you have a good sense of humor, too, T. Humor goes a long way in this business. <laughs> right. <laughs> I got to tell you, that that is fantastic. Just knowing that you're getting those those updates and you're plugged in because as the homeowner or the client, you're always asking. And it's I think it's better in your world, T, because now you're spoon feeding the info. You don't want to be sitting there. You're in the middle of a project. Ah, Mr. Jones just texted me again, wants to know where we are with that, you know, uh, the pipe that needs yeah, to be true. Exactly. Two things. I'm controlling the narrative, not that there's anything spurious or malicious about it, but I'm telling them the arc of the project so I can say, things are going great. This looks fantastic. I'm so excited for your project. And I am. And two, you know what, unexpectedly, since I started this thing a few years ago, it's cut down by about 80 to 90 percent of on-site meetings with the client because they're not necessary because they're getting a bunch of information they need to know through this update. Yes, we still want to meet in the field, look at stuff, but, you know, they're getting all this stuff. You can read every line of it yourself with pictures and descriptions. So it's like, great. So a time saver as well for all of us. Great idea. Great idea. Uh, so we're at that construction phase. You've updated the client. Where do we go from there? Well, behind the scenes, I've been making selections and making sure they work with what Teak's building mm -hmm. and we just layer and layer. So we start with the electrical and plumbing, and then we got to close up the walls. And then in the meantime, also I'm selecting furniture. So by the time the client moves in, they have a house. So a house they feel super cool in, super good in. And um, I, I sort of diluted the whole process that sure. we're working on a project now that's taken almost a year. But um, it's really just step by step. And I always advise my clients to don't look at the whole picture. Just look at what one step ahead of you is. Because a lot of times things tend to seem like everything's moving at a snail's place. But everything has its timeline. And everything's going the way it should. Especially towards the end. I don't know if you feel this way, Teak, but... The end when maybe we're a month out, six weeks out, and there's a ton of dust everywhere and, you know, mm -hmm. nothing's been painted. And and all of a sudden, it's like a miracle. It's like a miracle. After a month, they can move in. So Yeah, it's like a butterfly emerging from its cocoon. You're like, how is this thing ever going to be beautiful? And then 
you finish, you get your construction clean, you get your new groovy furniture moved in, and suddenly it's done. And at that stage of the game, the client's usually at maximum fatigue. You know, they're just in a thug because it's like, oh, man, we've been building this thing for a year. And for Rebecca and I, this is the everyday jam, man. This is no big deal. Uh, I want to add, too, that I love when uh, the client lets Rebecca pick new furniture and carpeting and stuff because a lot of times what happens is we finish a project and the client thinks they're going to move their old furniture in and, oh, we got these pieces and we finish it. And their old furniture moves in. It's like, oh, no, this is not going to work in this space, man. This looks like it should be thrown in the alley immediately. So the best projects, my favorite, are where... We do the new construction, and Rebecca brings the new furniture and pieces. Like, oh, this works because it's meant to fit with the rest of the stuff we just built. I totally see your point and visual there, and and some of us may be hanging on to that couch. I can get another couple of years off uh, off of that, and then, but you have these beautifully clean walls, new crisp design. It's like a new house, and then you've got this older furniture. And I, I see it. Like, you could, you could see the aged furniture in this space that's fresh and brand new. It's, and it's not coordinated by color or texture to right. what we just built. Right, exactly. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't want to say, you know, but suck it up and get, you know, freshen it up. You've, you've gotten to that point. No, now. suck it up. Suck it up, buttercup. I always say to my clients that your home, even if you can't afford right now to replace all the furniture, your home has to tell a story from room to room to room. Everything needs to be experienced at the same time. So even if we're, we're doing a very complex bathroom right now, but it's still the other bathrooms, they have their own personality, mm -hmm. but everything feels like it's part of the story that when you walk through the house, it's part of the story. And that's Great. my favorite part at the end. I, it's like reading a, a fairy tale. I, 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 I love that concept. Things have energy. That's my belief. We have energy and you've changed the energy of the home with the build. And now you're using the old energy of these objects. Um, and that was then, and that was great, but now it's now. So a change up. So thanks for bringing that up. We're, we're just about out of time. Um, how do we engage you, Rebecca? How do we teak? How do we do that? Sure. Um, go, go design group. Give me a call anytime. Would love to chat. 847-337-0526. Uh, and my uh, website, you can reach me there, gogodesigngroup.com. And Teak? Yeah, you can call me, 847-724-1510, or go to our website, macnon.com, M-A-C-N-O-N.com. Final question. We have about 30 seconds left. When mm -hmm. I got the email from Rebecca about Teak, I'm thinking that we're going to be talking about different types of wood, teak wood. <laughs> so I have to, how did you get that name? Uh, my pop named me, it's Gaelic. It's for T-E-A-G-U-E, -E, pronounced the same teak. He told me, uh, teak, I spelled it T-E-A-K to make your life easier. <laughs> and oh man, it's been so much easier for that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and I've heard the the other name <laughs> many times, but... <laughs> All right. Hey, by the way, I won't even let you know what my legal first name is. It's not even worth it. Uh, same oh, kind of now we're yeah. interested. Nah, now we got to know. Nah, you're not going to know. Oh, okay. <laughs> gonna, it, it's a girl's name. But anyway, uh, great having you guys on. Thanks for all the insight and the, the honesty in the process. And uh, looking forward next time. Uh, Rebecca, you and I get together. Okay. Thanks so much, Steve. Thank you, Teak. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Rebecca. See you soon. Thanks to you both. We're coming right back. Hang on. Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. Hey, Dad, how do airplanes fly? What's in this box? Can I touch this? Where does sand come from? Is this tree good for climbing? What happens if I mix these two things together? How are babies made? What does this thing do? Kids are curious about everything, including guns. Talking to them about gun safety in your home is a good first step, but you can do more. Always keep your guns locked, unloaded, and stored separately from ammunition. Storing your guns securely is the best way to prevent family fire. 
including unintentional shootings. For more information on safe gun storage and ways to keep your family safe, visit endfamilyfire.org. That's endfamilyfire.org. What do we keep in the attic? What's this thing called? Can I ride my bike backwards? Like I said, kids are curious. It's up to us to keep them safe. Brought to you by N Family Fire, Brady, and the Ad Council.